too. Obviously, been at the remembrance service this morning in the village. But just as folks are coming in, uh, just if we stay in our seats, we'll sing through just this month's song, and uh, the words will be on screen for you. A mighty fortress is our God.
morning, everybody. That woke you up. Uh, it's lovely to see you all here this morning uh, on this uh, Sunday to worship the Lord and also remember Sunday uh, where we take a moment to remember those who have given so much to make this possible. That we can continue to gather in freedom to worship our mighty fortress, our consuming fire, the great God Almighty. We have a number of announcements this morning, so please, please be patient with me. Um, and we'll get through them as quick as possible. Uh, on the windowsills, there are copies of the voters list. Noel announced that that was going to be published. Um, can I just remind you, as I'm duty-bound to do so, that voting members in the church are communicants on the role of the congregation who are listed, by, whether by name or number, as having contributed to the stipend or a weekly free will offering of the congregation in the last financial year. Should any member of the congregation who claims to be a voting member desire to make an objection regar regarding any name on the list or omit it from the list, they shall lodge their objections with the reasons in writing with the moderator of the Kirk session within a week of the first publication of the lists. If you don't understand that, come and talk to me afterwards. That is church speak in the rule book of our, of our denomination. But they're there. Please check them. Don't take them home. Please leave them there. Uh, have a quick glance at them. Uh, and if you have any queries, who's on it, who shouldn't, who isn't on it, come and speak or write it and give it to me this week at the manse. Village Christmas Light Switch On is only a couple of weeks away, Saturday the, the 26th. Uh, we're opening the hall again this year for tea and coffee and other bits and pieces. And I think it was Noel's idea, wasn't it? Or was it yours? It was Noel. I said, blame him, he's not here. Um, but Noel had the idea maybe we could do some carol singing. Gentlemen, we could do some carol singing. Uh, and so if you're interested in helping out, whether you can sing or just make a joyful noise, um, there's going to be a practice here, half three today, is that right? Um, to come and do a few carols, and we'll sing that in the hall on the 26th of November as folks are, are milling around. Gentlemen, men, okay? Let's step up. Let's go and do something. We're always getting the ladies to come and sing. I know they do sound better, but um, we'll sing. So half three this afternoon. Elders prayer, eight o'clock tomorrow night. Congregational prayer meeting in the park room at eight o'clock on Tuesday night. Ladies PW is on Wednesday. Uh, gentlemen, men alive on Thursday at eight with a guy called Colin Tinsley, who many of you will know. He works with Hope for Kids. Uh, and he'll be speaking about uh, the work that they were doing in Poland, helping with many of the Ukrainian refugees. So that could be a very, very interesting evening. It would be a good one to invite friends along who don't normally come. Next Saturday at 10 to 12 is the E3 Coffee Morning in First Balamina. Uh, you know Eve, who was here in the last couple of years and taking her back to school. This is a, a, a big morning for them to, to raise support uh, for that work. So if you're available next Saturday between 10 and 12, pop into First Balamina and you'll get a cup of coffee or tea and, and something else and be able to donate to that vital work. And in the evening, it's a tier fund big quiz. This year, we're, we're going to combine with Second Bershame. We're going to move down there uh, and join with them, a bigger crowd and, uh, and, and a lot more fun, hopefully. It's five pounds per person. Get a team together. Get a team together and come down for a night's crack. And uh, if you can't get a team together, uh, just come uh, and support it anyway. Janice is going to tell us a wee bit more about it. I think you have a video to show us, haven't you? So come on ahead up, Janice. I did have your name, but it was at the end of the announcement, so that's why I've said things. Just, just remind people, because nobody remembers the announcements, usually. Hi, I'm Leslie Slaughter, climate activist and environmental scientist, and I'm often online talking about the things we can all do to make a difference around the world. And today, I'm here to talk about another thing you can do joining Tier Fund for their big quiz night. Over the last four years, tens of thousands of people have joined in and have raised over £800,000 to support the work of Tier Fund, lifting people out of extreme poverty all around the world. You can join in on the 19th of November and follow this link to find out more. I hope to see you there. Thanks, Sarah, guys. So morning, everyone. I'd just like to encourage you to come along and support this uh, worthy cause, uh, Tier Fund Big Quiz Night. And we had it on our own before COVID, 
and now we're do do doing a joint venture with Second for Shane. So I'd like to encourage you all to come along and support this next Saturday night, the 19th of November at 7.30 to support the work of Tear Fund. So it'll be a good night of fun and fellowship. So either bring, as Ronnie said, either bring a team or come down and join in a team. It's five pound per head and refreshments and prizes will be provided. So it's nice to do things together as two congregations. So make an effort and come out. What else would you be doing Saturday night? Okay, so also, as Ronnie said, we're also opening the hall on Saturday the 26th for the Christmas tree switch on and Santa's pedal parade in the village from four to six. So again, we thought it would be a good idea to open the hall for tea and coffee and outreach just to the local community. So if you'd like to be part of this or help out in any way, come along to the hall in the afternoon or contact uh, Ronnie or Noah. So it's all about doing acts of kindness. And I just read this first this morning. I thought I would share it with you. Uh, when we show compassion and kindness, we reflect our God, who is gracious and compassionate and rich in love. That's Psalm 145, verse 8. And that's why the Apostle Paul urges us as God's people to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Colossians 3, verse 12. So it's about doing it all in the name of the Lord. So God has been good to us, and he has given us all our many blessings and has us overflowing with kindness. So how can we think about how we can show acts of kindness to other people and reach out uh, in uh, fellowship and um, help for the, our friends um, in the village? So it'd be nice to just support these two events and reach out to our community. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Janice. And uh, yeah, it'd be good, good night's fellowship over a uh, quiz and cup of tea. And uh, it would be lovely if First Machine came home with a prize for the best team. But, but, don't believe in competition. It's all a bit of fun. Not in the slightest. Uh, next Sunday is GP enrolment at half 11 in the morning. So it'd be great to see uh, all the girls out. We haven't had uh, an enrolment service since 2019. So it's going to be lovely to see the company out. And, and they've had a great turnout of girls uh, this year. Uh, and in the evening at 6.30, it's Connect. Uh, Monday week, it's the church committee meeting. 8 p.m., please. Church committee, Monday week. And one thing I forgot is cheap boxes. And have you space to bring your family home? Um, if you brought your shoe box and you haven't had a chance to give them to Anne, she'll be around after the service. Or if you've forgotten to bring it with you today, speak to Anne, and we can make arrangements for getting uh, those delivered to the collection centre. We're here to worship God. That's what we're here to do. Psalm 146. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation, in his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Our opening praise reminds us, our, my hope is hidden in the Lord, because the Lord is my salvation. Let's stand and sing that wonderful truth. of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and by 
and greatly to be praised. Father, we just have to look around to see your greatness displayed. Creation shows us your, your wonderful work. It shows us your almighty power. It shows us how beautiful you are. As Romans 11 reminds us, Lord, for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for, for his glory. All glory to him forever. Father, you do deserve all the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise, everything that we can give because you are God and you are great. But Father, forgive us for we we don't do that. We don't give the glory. We want to take it for ourselves. We want to receive it, thinking that through our own abilities and talents, through our own achievements, that people should elevate us. Father, forgive us for being so proud, so arrogant. 
thinking that we are the center of the universe and not you. Forgive us for trying to replace you as king of our lives. And thank you, Lord, that you, you are patient with us. You are long-suffering. And Father, you are merciful and gracious. And you have shown that mercy and grace so amazingly, so clearly, when you sent your son, Jesus. You gave your only begotten son, perfect in every way, as a sacrifice, as the one who would pay the price, receive the punishment that each and every one of us deserve. So that through faith in him, the crucified and risen and ascended son, we would be rescued from our self-centered, self-relying, narcissistic living. Father, without you, without you giving us your son, we will be without hope. We'll be lost forever. So, Lord, who is like you among the gods, O oh Lord? No one. No one. Because no one has made us except you. And no one loves us except you. You are our protector, our provider, our redeemer, our sustainer. And so, Lord, today as we gather, as people created in your image, marred by sin, but redeemed by the blood of the, your Son, the one who breathed life into us, Father, may we use our voices, may we, we live our lives in such a way that we will proclaim your name, that we will declare that you are Lord of all, that we will give you all of glory and the praise and the honor. And we ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, boys and girls, I want you to stay in your seats today, okay? I know uh, we'll get back to normal next week, but, but I want you to stay in your seats. Couple here, here. No. no. Okay, you're all here. We have a few empty pews this morning, don't we? People missing. You notice it maybe in Sunday school as well. There weren't just many people around. Um, that's because they were marching through the village. They are on a wee parade. On a wee parade, and, and actually they just kept marching that way. They just kept going the whole way through, and they went to uh, St. Patrick's. Can anybody tell me why? Can anybody tell me why that's happened? Any of the boys and girls? Why, why, are, why are lots of people parading today and going up to St. Patrick's? Don't put his hand down, Yvonne. Give him the answer and let him shout it out. <laughs> Go on, Jack. What is it? It's Remembrance there. Remembrance Sunday. That's right. It's a very, very special day. All over the country and, and in many parts of the world as well, people are, are stopping today to remember. To remember lots of men and women who in the past and even t in the present who, who have given their lives as soldiers and as sailors and as airmen and many other ways, given their lives to defend our freedom so that we today can, can do this and many, many other things. We have lots of freedom in our country and there's places in the world that people are not able to live the way we do. We, can, we are free to choose where we live. We are free to choose what we want to be when we go up. We are free... I was going to say we're free to go to school, but you're not really, you're told to go to school. But anyway, we can go to school. We're free to come to church and free to worship and, uh, and tell others about our God. We are free to choose so, so much in our lives. So, so much without, without people telling us, no, you must live this way. You must do this. You can't do that. We have so much freedom, boys and girls. It's unbelievable. But it cost. That freedom cost a big, big price. And that's why we have Remembrance Day or, or, or Remembrance Sunday, to remember those who paid the price, who gave their lives so that we could live the way we do today. Maybe you did that on Friday because Friday was actually Remembrance Sunday, the 11th of the 11th. Maybe you did that in school. I know some schools did. But we do it on Remembrance Sunday 
we have special parades like we did down the village in front of the, the war memorial and we have moments in, in church services to remember what people paid so that we could enjoy life the way that we do. But there's a greater freedom than that. There's a much greater freedom than the one that we enjoy because of these military people who gave their lives. The Bible tells us that there's a freedom in Christ, a freedom in Jesus. We know the story. You're well taught at home and in, and, and in Sunday school and everything else. The Bible tells us we are slaves to the devil, that we live in sin, and the price of sin is death, but we can be set free from that, free to live life in all of its fullness, free to live, have an eternal life instead of facing death. But just as our freedom to do this today came at a price, our freedom to have eternal life came at a price. Just as many gave their lives in wars, boys and girls, many, many still give their lives. The Bible tells us that someone gave their life so we could be free. It tells us that on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus gave it all. He laid down his life to rescue us from the penalty of sin. And so today is Remembrance Sunday. We remember the, all the military people who, and others who laid down their lives in terrible, terrible wars to set us free. But we remember, every day we should remember the one who set us free from the punishment that we deserve, who set us free to know God as our God and as our Savior and as our Father and to know the hope of eternal life with him. Never forget the price that was paid. And what we're going to do now is stand in a wee minute for a moment's silence to remember all those people. To remember all those people who have given their lives in, in terrible, terrible wars over the years. And to thank God for those who have paid the price for our freedom. So let us stand. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. When you go home, tell him of us and say, for your tomorrow, we give our today.
please be seated. And John Maben now is going to come and, and lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, through this act of remembrance, we give thanks for the bravery of men and women who have served to protect us and have been willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice so that we could go on living in freedom and security. Help us all to realize the significance of that sacrifice and the true extent of what they have done for us. Not only did they fight for us, but they won for us the victory. And without their bravery, these wars might have been lost and our lives could have been so very different without the liberty we so much enjoy. For the loss of life in all wars, and for those whose loved ones could never return, we are sad, Lord, and we pray that those bereaved as a result of conflict may truly know your comfort. For those serving now across the world, may you protect them and grant them hearts that seek peace. As conflicts rage on around our planet, we pray for the civilian men, women, and children whose lives are disfigured by the brutality of war, that you will draw close in your mercy. For all those who bear the burden and privilege of leadership, may you grant them your wisdom and resolve to seek peaceful solutions to problems and unrest. For peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep the world secure, May they know your discernment and compassion for all life. We also remember, Lord, that you won the ultimate victory for us on the cross when sin and death were defeated forever. Help us all to lift our eyes above the disruption of this broken world and give us the grace to pray for those who would wish us harm. Father, we hold before you now those whose memory we cherish, most of whose names we will never know. Though the years go on, we will never forget the debt we owe them. And as we honour the past, may we put our faith completely in a loving and merciful God for our earthly and our eternal future. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. John, thank you very much for uh, leading us in that prayer. We go on. Now we're back on again. We're going to worship God now uh, with our offering. And as we present our financial gifts for the work of God's kingdom, we're going to remain seated as the offering is collected. And we're going to sing uh, the old hymn that reminds us that it is in Jesus and in Jesus alone that we find our true peace and our true hope. Uh, and then I'll get us to rise for the end of the hymn as the offering is brought to the front. So let us remain seated and sing, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
Let's go head out to Children's Church now, if they want. Thank you. continue our studies in the book of Joshua. Would you like to open it with me, please, into Joshua chapter 6. Um, we're going to read the first 20 verses of it today. I'd say it was a real challenge trying to work my way through this this week. You know, you think Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, we bones. That's a straightforward passage, but there's so much in it. It's unbelievable, and, 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 and just, well, we're not going to be able to do it justice, uh, but we, we'll have a go at seeing what lessons we can learn uh, from these opening 20 verses. Let's hear the word of God as we find it in Joshua chapter 6 from verse 1. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests will, uh, shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long, long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before it. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men who were, uh, were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city going about at once. And they came into the camp and spend the, spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. And the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, walked on. And they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them. And the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. On the second day, they marched around the city once and returned into the camp. So they did for six days. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Amen, and we thank God for his word. And we know he blesses the reading of his truth. And I will pray that he will apply it to our hearts. Let's pray for a moment. Father, indeed, come and, and teach us much. This is a story that we know, we've known from childhood. We have sung songs about, Father, it's a, a, a story full of great truths that, the Lord, if we would grasp them, that we would enrich our lives. 
uh, and enrich our service for your kingdom. So Lord, give us ears to hear what you have to say and hearts that are fertile, the seed that will be sown and will produce an abundant harvest. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What have Julius Caesar, Saladin, Horatio Nelson, I shouldn't have put this one down, Isoruko Yamamoto, George S. Patton have in common? Hope this doesn't come up in the quiz next Saturday night. They are names that are on li- consistently on lists of the top t- military strategists of all times. The top military strategists. Julius Caesar, I came, I saw a conquered how true. Saladin, Saladin defeated the Crusaders. Nelson, well, we know about him. Yamamoto, he was the one who came up with a plan to attack Pearl Harbor. And George S. Patton. He helped liberate Western Europe in the Second World War by using the same tactics that the Germans were using, or Nazis were using against uh, the Allies. These strategists took time to assess their enemy, to find their weaknesses, to to consider the risks of sending troops in, and then they developed the plan based on the resources that they had at their disposal in order to achieve their ultimate aim, which is to destroy their enemy. Last time out, we um, were looking at Joshua. He was uh, on the outskirts of Jericho. He was probably developing his strategy for the great battle that was about to come. And it was going to be a, a challenge, as we, we mentioned last time, and as the opening verse of our reading this, mor- this morning said, Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the, the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. Locked up tight. No sign of a weakness anywhere in the structure of that city. But Joshua wasn't green behind the ears. He wasn't totally naive when it came to battle. He had had faced enemies before in the the wilderness wanderings, and you can find that in, in the book of Exodus. He had experience in battle. And it's interesting, when I was was researching these military strategists, I came across one article that said this. The Bible's full of military strategy, if you look closely. And one who was a great strategist was Joshua. Joshua was known for using ambushing tactics. And this, the rest of this wee article goes into to, to chapter 8 and the, the, the uh, war battle against the city of Ai. Against that city, he chose warriors to go around the backside and he and his warriors went towards the city and drew them out. As Joshua and his forces ran, the forces he sent behind attacked the armies of Ai from behind. And Joshua turned his forces and they destroyed them, which allowed them to take the city. Besides, believe it or not, not only was he a great strategist, but listen to this bit, believe it or not, Joshua had the greatest weapon of all, God. God was on, well, Joshua was on God's side. Remember from last time, a couple of weeks ago, Joshua had this uh, strange encounter as he was outside Jericho, um, who, who said to himself, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And what was Joshua's response? What does my Lord say to his servant? Very wise words. A very sensible question that all of us need to ask. And while Proverbs were written long after Joshua, this, this verse that we all know well it could, have, could have been applied to his attitude at this time. Joshua, or Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And that's exactly what Joshua was doing here. He was acknowledging the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army. He was leaning upon him. What do, what do you say to me? What, have, what advice have you got to give me? And you know, the wonderful thing is about God is that he never leaves his people alone. The Lord is always there for his people. 
He never leaves them to their own devices or their own wisdom or their own ideas and strategies. But he always comes to their aid with a divinely provided plan of how they should serve him and fight for him. And he revealed that to, to Joshua in, in, in verses 3 and following about marching around the city once a day for six days uh, and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns and, and marching before the ark of the Lord. And then on the seventh day, going around seven times and the priests blow their trumpets and when they get that long blast, when they hear that sound, they are to shout and the walls were to, would fall. This is the plan that God gave to uh, Joshua. Don't think that's what he was expecting. I'm, I'm sure that really wasn't what he was looking to hear from the Lord. Because this, this wasn't a normal strategy. This, this, this hadn't been done before. They had fought battles under the guidance of God, with instructions from God, and, uh, and they'd gone out in hand-to-hand combat with their enemies. This was this was a normal military strategy. It was incredibly unusual, highly unusual to say the very least. But God's strategies are unusual. In fact, his greatest strategy for victory over his enemies, well, Someone said God's plan of salvation and deliverance is not a plan that man would design if he could or could if he would because of his basic alienation from God and proneness to depend on his own solutions. And that's why so many, even folks who who grew up in the church and, and are taught the way of salvation, feel that they need to add something. This, this can't be right. This just doesn't sound right. How, how can I just have this trust in, in the name of Jesus, as we've been singing about, and, and, and that everything will be fine with God? How, how come? I must have to do something about it. I must have to, to do some good works or, 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 or do this or, or, or do that. I have to, I have to add to it. God, that, that can't be right. I've got to have some control, some input into my salvation. Friends, God's plan for salvation is unusual. It goes against the grain for our sinful selves. But God's plan for salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by the grace of God alone. There is nothing we can add to it. That's God's plan. Made abundantly clear in this book. It's unusual, but God does things his way. Previous times, as I said, the people of Israel had adopted traditional means of warfare against those who attacked them, but it was very different this time because this time it would require immense faith. It would require great faith from Joshua who, who received this from the Lord because he would then have to go and communicate it to the priests and to the people. Uh, 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 and then lead the people with confidence and with assurance that, that, that the Lord was in control and they were doing the right thing. It would require great faith from the priests and, uh, and, the, and the nation itself because they would have to trust that Joshua was indeed leading them in the ways of the Lord and he wasn't winding them up or had lost his mind or whatever, but he was actually obeying the word of the Lord. David Jackman says, the way in which the victory came was chosen by the Lord so that it would be ingrained in their memory that this first victory was the gift of their gracious sovereign commander. Going into battle against Jericho in this way was to to, to ensure that, that there would be no doubt in the minds of the nation who was in control and who was giving them the victory. God and God alone. It had nothing to do with the people. And this truth is emphasized in a, in a couple of ways uh, in this chapter. Firstly, the centrality of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you know, it's mentioned quite a bit in, in these uh, verses. And it had, had had to go out into battle, which do- didn't happen. The Ark never went into battle. But in this case, God said the Ark has to go out into this battle. 
verses 6 and 7. Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. Putting the ark of the Lord in the middle of this parade was a visible reminder to the people of Israel that they had to keep their minds and their heart and their focus upon God. That God was present with them. And they had to focus on him rather than dwelling on the, on the challenge that lay before them or, or, or focusing on their own strategies and ideas and, uh, and resources. But they had to focus on God. They had to meditate upon him and trust in him. He was in their midst. And he would give them the victory. Another way that we, we see that God is in control of this uh, and his plan is right is, is the frequent use of the number seven. Number seven is, is the number of per, perfection or completeness in the scriptures. And it reminds us that this plan of God, no matter how foolish it seems to us and maybe to the people of the time, that his way was perfect. It cannot be improved upon by any person. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens, or for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. Friends, if the people had a rushed in and used all the strategies of the time, they would have been defeated by Jericho. They wouldn't have won. They wouldn't have won because it wasn't God's way. There was no, in fact, to call the Battle of Jericho is a bit of a, well, it's not quite right because it wasn't really a fight as such. God gave them the victory. Verse 2, see, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. God set aside any contribution that, 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 that the nation could, could give in this battle, and he won the victory. He put fear into the, Jer the people of Jericho's hearts and minds. He was the one who brought the walls tumbling down. They didn't collapse inwards. They didn't collapse outwards. The, 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 the language here says that they came straight down to, to, to illustrate that, the, that they were collapsed by God himself. And this was done so that those around the Israelites and, and even the enemies and for us generations that are could see, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And friends, we've got to grasp that truth, that the power to defeat our enemies, spiritual enemies, is God's power. And too often, we place our hope in, in organizing events or activities or organizations. We place our hope in preachers, we place our hope in how we think the work of the Lord should be done to win people for Christ and to help the church grow and for the kingdom of God to be a, a, a bright and, and powerful influence on society once again. But when we think that way, then we are relying on our plans, our abilities, our skills, and we are in danger of patting ourselves on the back saying, I did a good job there. That was great. That was great. Friends, the truth is, lives can only be changed by the power of God. And we are mere instruments through which he displays his power. Mere instruments. We need to have humility like Joshua and continually ask as we look to serve him in our own lives and in our congregational lives, what does my Lord say to his servant? And we need to have the faith to, to trust in his plans, even if they seem unusual, uncomfortable, strange to us. But not only was faith needed by Joshua, not only is faith needed by ourselves as we consider uh, God's leading and guiding, but patience patience. 
Six days they had to walk around the city in complete and utter silence. They couldn't even whisper to their mate as they went round. Had to stay completely quiet. The only noise that was, was to be heard was the noise of the, the trumpets, which was a sign of celebration and victory uh, for the people of God. Each day they went round, nothing. Second day, nothing. Third day, nothing. And then on the seventh day, Joshua says, he had to walk around it seven times in the same way. I don't know about you, this church, Jericho wasn't a big city, but I'd be getting a wee bit fidgety by that stage. Seriously. And maybe Joshua did get it wrong. And they could have started to grumble and to doubt and, and start to whisper to each other. But they didn't. They stuck at the plan. They were patient because they had faith in God's wisdom. And they went round on the seventh time, on the seventh day, and the trumpet blasted that long blast. And they shouted. No idea what, but they shouted. And we read that the wall fell flat. So that the people went into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured it, just as God had promised. Friends, patience is sorely lacking in life, isn't it? In all walks of life. In all walks of life including in the church. We want things to happen immediately. We want things to happen in our time and in our way. We run this event and we want this response to come out of it right away. Friends, that's not how God works. That's not how God works. The God, God works slowly and gradually. He can come in, in an amazing way and do things like that, but, but that's not, if we read the scriptures and look at church history, that's not how God works. He works slowly. He tests our faith through working slowly to, to strengthen our, our trust in him, to develop our character as his children, as we, we thought about when we were studying James last year. And patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a characteristic that should grow and be evident in the lives of God's children. It's mentioned much in the Bible. Lamentations 3. It is good that one should wait, be patient, quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Psalm 62. For God alone, O my soul, wait, be patient in silence, for my hope is from him. Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. And this idea of waiting up excuse me, waiting upon the Lord, being patient, trusting in his word, and something Paul prayed for the church in Colossians chapter one. May you be strengthened, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with Friends, the work of the kingdom takes time. We are simply called to be patient and to trust and obey in God's plan as he has revealed it in this, in this, his eternal word. The Art of War is a book from the 5th century BC. Some of you may have heard of it. It's, it's quoted in films and, and different things. Uh, it's a book from, from China. It was full of, of sk skills relating to warfare and how, how to overcome your enemy. And, and, and even after all these centuries, it's still used today or still influencing the thinking of military strategies, of businesses, of all sorts of things. It, it's an incredibly influential book, The Art of War. Friends, we are at war, not like Jericho, not like the great battles of the past, but we are in a spiritual war, a spiritual war. And God has given us his art of war, the strategies that we are to use to defeat our great spiritual enemy, to defeat sin, to defeat our indifference, to defeat our materialism, our pride, our, our self-righteousness and our godlessness, to defeat the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present age, our darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And it's called the Bible. It's called the Word of God. This is the book that tells us how to win in the Christian life. Nothing else. No other scheme of man 
the word of God. It tells us the weapons that God has given to us at our disposal, the armor of God, the power of prayer. It speaks of the tactics that we are to use against the evil one. Do you remember that? Jesus in the wilderness, and the evil one came to attack him and to, and to cause him to turn from God. And what did Jesus say? The word of God says. The sword of the spirit. This is what we are to use to push back the forces of evil and to see people become disciples of Jesus. It tells us that we are to show compassion to those in need, to love our enemy, to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who abuse us. This is not the way of the world, but it's the way God tells us that we need to live to overcome evil and destroy the powers of darkness. It's all in this book. Last week, I I read a verse. It's it's a verse that keeps coming up time and time again in, in, in life. It's a verse that sums up for me what we have to do, how we have to live to win spiritual battles. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Not to run organizations every single night of the week. Not to run massive events. But to live this way daily for God. To show his mercy and his love and his justice and his goodness in the way that we go about our daily lives. That's how the early church grew. They loved the Lord, they devoted themselves to his word, and they loved one another. And the church went boom. You heard open doors last week. And as I was sharing with some folks during the week, we were at a church where we were hearing about missionary work in another country where it's uh, uh, illegal to, to, to convert to Christianity. No big events, no massive organizations, but the church is growing faster than we, are, than we are shrinking in this country. Why? Because people are acting justly, loving mercy, walking humbly with their God, living according to God's art of war according to God's plan for battle in this book. And if we all put that into practice, imperfect though it will be in our daily lives, what a difference that would make to our society. The people of Israel laid aside whatever ideas, plans uh, they may have had to defeat Jericho. Whatever they had seen in the past or seen others doing, they laid to one side. And they obeyed the word of the Lord. Even though it seemed weird, contrary to common sense, they obeyed the word of the Lord. Friends, we must do the same. We must do what the Lord says if we want to see victory. We want to see his kingdom grow and the darkness defeated. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, and Father, your word is, is challenging. It's, it's, it's hard for us to comprehend. It goes against our, our nature as we thought about. But Father, it's your word. It's perfect. It's perfect in every way. But you are God. You are wisdom. You know exactly how you are going to fulfill your purposes. So Father, help us to become humble like Joshua and to the people of this time and as they face this battle and to listen for you to wait for you, to say, what would the Lord say to me? And Father, then to walk in your ways. It's not rocket science, Lord, how to to live. It's not rocket science how we are to win people for Christ. We are to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. We are to be a walking sermon that when people look at us, they see you. They see people of integrity, of humility. People filled with joy and thankfulness because of the God who has rescued them and that they worship. Father, in, in, in all we do this week, Father, whether it's within the walls of our property here or whether it's just out and about in daily life, Lord, may, may people see you in us. May we bring them hope 
May we encourage one another. And those who, within our numbers who are unwell, who are worried, who, Lord, are just feeling under pressure, may we be that uh, arm of comfort and compassion. Uh, Lord, may we show that you are a God who cares for them and loves them immensely. Father, we think of our young folks, and we know there are some doing transfer tests at the moment, and it's at a, quite a, a pressure time, and we simply pray for uh, your hand to be upon them and upon their families. Lord, to, to give them the, the trust and the faith to know that you are in control, and they just have to give their best, work as hard as they possibly can, Lord, but your, their future is in your hands. And so, Lord, may they, they be able to look to you at this time. May their parents be able to encourage them. May their school teachers encourage them, Lord, and, and, and to give up their best, but to remind them that they are precious no matter what a piece of paper says about them. And, Father, we do think of the persecuted church. As you were challenging us all last week about a church that is just, well, they have no idea what, how they can, we can do what we can do. They're hiding. They're imprisoned. They're executed, and yet they stand firm, and they continue to live for you. And Father, you're doing amazing things through them, amazing things through them and in so many countries that are closed officially to missionary work, and yet you, by your Spirit, are redeeming day after day after day people into your church. Father, may we look to them as our example. May we be rebuked by their faithfulness and may we put into practice their courage and their devotion to you. So Father, hear our prayers and Father, plant your word deep in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, we're I haven't heard the band, so you're all right. Um, we're called the battle. We're called the war, uh, a spiritual war, but the great thing is we don't go in our own strength, but we go in the strength that the Lord has given us. Uh, we go with the weapons he has provided for us. We know, we go knowing that the outcome is secure, that the victory is won because he has won it. And we go out and, bat and do battle, not for ourselves, but we go out, as this final song says, which you know, but there's a little we add a bit that the Gettys and Chris Tomlin have put in it. It says, arise, shine. Why? For the risen sun. We go and do it for Christ and his glory. O oh, church, arise and put your armor on.
Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God through him. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.